Hey, hey, party people. This is Watch Me Design a Fashion Collection, part five. If you are looking for fashion design process tutorials, please go visit my fashion design process playlist. They are all, there's 10 to 12 videos in there. They're all organized in order that you should watch them in. And it goes step by step as to how to do all the things to design a fashion collection, all the way from gathering inspiration, to putting together a project for your portfolio. This series, this Watch Me Design series, is more like watching me do things. Like, I talk a lot. I can't help it. You know, I'm informative at best, didactic at worst. <laughs> but I'm like, the goal is not to give you a comprehensive lesson on what I'm working on. It's just I give you all these tips as I'm working on a design project for myself. This is not for a client. This is just for my own, like, I want to design some stuff. Stuff. And a lot of you have been asking me if I'm going to make these, like if they're going to go into production. Here's the thing, okay? I am going to design this project as if it could be mass produced. Okay, at the end of the day, wherever this goes, it's going to be something where it can be mass produced, which means I'm not going to do a lot of like, you know, hand painting, individual minutia that cost $17,000 to produce sort of thing. Okay, the end goal is to try to use processes that are mass producible. Um, but I'm, you know, I the thing is, is like, I can't always predict how popular a series is going to be to the end. And so I'm going to take this series as far as there's interest. And yeah, like, and as far as I'm, I have money, like producing a fashion collection takes a lot of money. So we'll see. All right. But I will be designing as if I was thinking about producing this. So what am I doing now? I am putting together a uh, a customer visual board. And I highly recommend that most of you do this, okay? Because this is way easier to communicate who your customer is than uh, a, a long essay. You know, you could if you can distill your customer in a few phrases that people can read real quick, that's great too. Um, I use celebrities. For two reasons. Number one, because this is going on a YouTube channel. I don't want to use somebody's personal photos unless they're my personal photos, you know. But you'll see that later. Like, I, there are pictures where I take them and I cut them up. But for of people, I like to choose celebrities because, you know, they're, kind, they're public figures. You know, I found these images very easily on Google, like very cursory Google search. And most of these images are famous. There were, you know, so it's like, it's not a big deal. Okay. Number two, I also like using famous people in my customer profile because then lots of people know who they are. Well, lots more than kind of your average person. Like there are all, of course, photos of like, um, just private citizens really capturing a look that you're going for. But in terms of attitude and mood and what they might stand for, it's really easy to show off a celebrity because, you know, think about it. Like when I was talking about my customer, I was talking about, you know, androgyny and playing with gender norms. And so when I have pictures of David Bowie and Janelle Monet, you know, you know, oh, yeah, like they dress outside of gender norms and, you know, like you're getting that vibe. Right. And then I was talking about how I want to dress older people and how I also want to dress um, the like address the fact that there aren't awesome clothes for older people, that people expect older dress, older people to dress super fuddy duddy. And I wanted to address the older people who don't dress like that, that are fashionable and have fun with fashion. And so I found this 80 year old model in China <laughs> and of course, the accidental icon. So I'm putting these images together. I'm using this silver tape. And please don't ask me where I got it because I don't remember. <laughs> you forget. I'm a super old lady with like decades of accumulated art supplies. I don't know where I got everything. <laughs> so I 
trace this uh, shape off of the, one of the images in the Fashion Algebra book, uh, the Anna Piaget book. And honestly, you know how sometimes you have this thing rattling around in your brain and you just got to like do it and it's stuck. You're not really sure where it's going to go or how it's going to turn out or if you're ever going to use it, but it's in your brain. So you have to do it. And I know you guys have watched me do these outlining vibration, uh, things before. And I don't know why it's still stuck in my brain, but it is. So it has to come out. And so now I have the markers or a lot of the markers for the color story I will be using. So now I'm moving forward. I'm collaging with my color story in mind. So as I'm collaging, my collaging is getting more and more specific to my end goal. And, but it, it's, this kind of thing is still stuck in my head and I'm not really sure why, but I'm just going to keep doing it until something rattles loose. So I'm at this point when I was filming this, I was struggling still with my color story. And when we last left off, I had created these chips. I had finalized these colors and I had decided I needed some more pinks. I went to the store, I got more pinks and a couple more dull blues. And, you know, now I'm playing with them. And when I was shooting this, I was getting increasingly frustrated at myself because the more I was playing around with the colors, I just wasn't liking it. And I remember when I first put that Rock and Gems collage together, I really liked that collection, that those colors. And I was getting super irritated because no matter what I was doing, I just wasn't in love with it. And I know me, I have to like I have to really believe in the colors because you know how I'm always talking about the importance of colors and how the first impact is the colors and I believe that and so I can't just like have a mediocre freaking color story for my collection and since I'm just doing this for my own enjoyment I'm not in a hurry so I'm like all right fine I'm just gonna freaking dick around until I get the colors right and then and then and then and then I watch Stranger Things I was just going to check it out, uh, one or two episodes. Uh, those of you who follow my channel know I've been feeling uh, really poorly lately, and so I was just going to like lay around and watch some TV. And oh my, <laughs> I got so sucked into it. I watched all eight episodes oh, like over two days. <laughs> it was so good. And a lot of you are like, oh, I don't want to watch a show about kids. It's not about kids. It's about kids being awesome, but it's really not about kids. It's so, it's, it was so good. And like, I have, I have two brains always whenever I watch something. And one brain is following the story, following what's going on, the action, the romance, whatever. And then the other is constantly looking at the visuals. And it's just, it's just who I am. And so I'm watching and I'm totally sucked into the story. And, uh, but like, I can't help but look at the colors. There's these particular scenes where I'm really arrested with the colors. And so I think I've figured out how I'm going to do address the color story now. I'm like 99% sure. But yeah, it, you know, sometimes it happens like that. Like I'm going to be doing as much of the designing as I can on camera but you know there are just some things like I design as I go I've been scribbling in this I've been carrying this sketchbook around and scribbling in it wherever I go these days and I'll be I'll be sharing that content with you in the videos but yeah like that kind of stuff happens all the time and so I will be sharing the results of my new color decisions next week, but this is still the process, you know? Uh, someone left a comment about how these videos, it's just like not enough action, it's like really slow and kind of boring, and it's like, well, yeah, you know? Sometimes work looks boring because sometimes work is boring, you know? It's not like I enjoy, you know, this whole like being frustrated at my color story, 
like to a certain extent I enjoy it because this is the kind of frustration I enjoy, but at, on, it, some work is always going to be tedious. And, you know, as I told that person in the comment and don't go trolling this person because, you know, they, like it wasn't like a fight we got into or anything. I just wanted to clarify to this person, like, you know, my channel is really like about lifting the glamour veil of fashion. You know, I, I post all these interviews with these real working professionals so they can give you an idea as to what it's really like to work in fashion. And, you know, the glamour of it comes from the actual work. I think the glamorous part are the beautiful things that we get to make working in fashion, the beautiful drawings that we get to paint and things like that. But the actual work of it, it's not glamorous at all. <laughs> and sometimes in the real world, it's about just sitting at your desk and figuring out freaking color stories for a few hours. And it's, it's not very action filled or interesting to look at. It really isn't. But is it part of the process? Oh yes, it is. It is indeed part of the process. And yeah, so, you know, just because I figured out my color story in a different way, this is not something I like don't still recommend to put down your colors and, you know, use the little uh, cardstock chips to cover up some colors and kind of figure out what you're editing out because it is a process that works for me a lot of the time. Just this time I just happily happened upon some cool lighting scenes in this awesome TV show. I've uh, had students both here and in person ask me if I enjoy using fashion forecasting, color forecasting services. And I've never used a fashion forecasting or color forecasting service before, uh, which <laughs> uh, is a little bit funny because I've actually uh, worked on like freelance projects. I've had freelance projects where I've worked on fashion forecasting assignments where I put together collages and I've put together illustrations and things for fashion forecasting companies to use in their fashion forecast. But, <laughs> but I've never used the service uh, as a designer. Uh, so I can't speak of it. I, I, I've never sought one out. Because I've always felt that forecasting companies were a bit like self-fulfilling prophecies. Like you put together a bunch of ideas as to what you think are coming down the pipeline. And you sell the same forecasting presentation to a bunch of these companies. And, you know, let's say you have 12 ideas and each company, you sell them to hundreds of companies and each company takes one of the 12 ideas and runs with it, but it's still like 12 ideas. And so you, you start to see varieties on a theme and then you're like, Oh, my forecast worked. Uh, yeah, no, I don't know. <laughs> so as much as I love companies like Pantone and the color services that they provide, I have, uh, and I've seen some forecasting presentations and I think they're cool looking. I should, I should think so because I've worked on them. But um, yeah, I've never worked with them, so I cannot speak from experience. Never start fabric shopping without some kind of idea as to what you're looking for. Okay, there are inspiration fabric trips where you can go to a fabric jobber or retail store and just walk around and try to feel inspired by materials. In fact, that's something I encourage you all to do. But if you are going to walk into a meeting with a fabric sales rep, do not waste their time by going in there without knowing what you want and just like aimlessly going through their headers. These are business people. Time is money. Just don't waste their time. You don't have to walk in and be like, I need a 24 mummy silk du peony in a rose pink three yards. I don't, you don't need to like tick off a purchase order. 
but go in there with some idea as to what you know like oh i need a couple of bottom weights i'm look i'm looking for wool meltins or similar things of this kind of weight and i'm looking at this kind of color story i want i'm hopefully looking for dark greens and dark blues and then i would also like to look at some uh you know cotton shirtings like go in there with like can I say general specifics or specific generals? I don't know. Something like that. You know what I mean? So I have ideas percolating in my mind as to fabrics. I know I want to use denim. I know I want to use chambray. I know I want to use medium to heavyweight linens. And I am thinking about washing all of them because I, I eventually want to make all my garments machine washable and I want to be washing them in the process so they have kind of like a washed lived in sort of look and i'm also thinking about matte silks like crepes dupionis um and nothing slinky shiny drapey sexy just more in the able to you know construct a little bit able to fold up a little bit uh stiffer kind of medium weight like i'm talking like 12 to 20 mummy nothing slinkier than that like nothing lighter than that no chiffons no organzas nothing like that and nothing super heavy i don't want like a duchess satin that looks very couture like okay so i'm narrowing down my choices and again i'm doing one of these thingies with my colors because i can't stop myself it's kind of an illness um and i don't know if i've shown y'all this side of my personality yet but i can get a bit obsessive when i decide to fixate on something so remember when i told you about the friend that i made on my second trip to japan and how she was obsessed with rust and was posting all these rust photos and i got enamored with her rust photos so in doing research for this project, I went through all of my Japan photos, especially from the first trip, because I, I ended up taking way more photos on my first trip. And instead of taking apart and scanning those borrow books, <coughs> I pulled photos that I took when I went to go visit the Amuse Museum in Tokyo, which is all borrow. And so I pulled my photos and I printed a bunch out and I started going through my photos and I realized I was obsessed with my friend's rust photos because I had already taken like so many rust photos on my first trip and then I promptly forgot about them. <laughs> so I'd already had this kind of like interest in it and I kind of was distracted and stopped thinking about it. And, you know, I was particularly interested in uh, rust and wood decay and interesting doors and chipping paint kind of like all together, not like straight up rust like my friend is. And <laughs> so I pulled those, I printed a bunch of them out. And then of, of course I have my remaining rock and gem pictures. And now I'm gonna just start collaging on some figures. And these are my fashion figure templates, uh, printed kind of small. And, you know, per usual, if you want these fashion figure templates, you can go hit up my Etsy store, zoehong.etsy.com. Link is in the description box. And now I'm using glitter glue. I've given up on the glue stick. Screw the glue stick, it does not help me in any fashion. And I have this glitter glue Oh, I remember what, the, yeah, like I said, I have random craft supplies. This glitter glue is actually from a Halloween uh, costume. I dressed up as Miss Congeniality. I wore a dress. I made myself a pageant sash, and I wrote Miss Congeniality with uh, this glitter glue. I had, like, a police badge and handcuffs and a tiara. Good times. Anyway, so I have glitter glue. But it's still glue, okay? I love glitter, but it's still glue, and it works way better than the glue stick. I don't know why I'm talking so long about this freaking glue. Sorry, glitter makes me happy. Whatever. So now I'm just cutting up stuff, and I'm collaging them onto figures. And, you know, I'm not really designing dresses yet. Uh, I've also... Um, do you remember when I was first doing those collages and then I took pictures with my cell phones of sections of those collages? 
Well, I took those into Photoshop. I manipulated some of the colors um, as much as I could. I blew them up, played with the scale. I printed them out uh, so that I could kind of focus on certain parts. And I'm doing this. I'm having fun with it. I'm creating big shapes with colorful visual texture. And I don't know yet. I haven't really thought it out. It's part of the process. I don't know how I'm going to create these looks. Okay, what am I going to do with these black lines? How am I going to achieve these black lines? Am I going to, are they going to be piping? Or I already said I didn't want to do a whole bunch of like hand painting, hand work things that aren't easily mass producible. Or are they? Um, am I going to make a custom print? Am I going to create scenes and then bind the scenes in black? Am I, like, there are a lot of things that I could think about. I, I could applique big colorful patches. I could be doing embroideries. Like, there are a lot of things I could do, but it's like I'm taking these shapes, I'm taking these colors, these colors of shapes and these lines and just collaging them and just kind of running with it. Remember how in the fashion design process series, like, I kept repeating over and over again, it's about taking these vague inspirational images, ideas, moods, music, feelings, obsessions, and just trying to distill it down into more and more specific visual items until you have clothes that you are satisfied with, right? And so I'm still at that phase where this shit don't look like clothes. <laughs> I mean, not really. <laughs> But we're getting there. We're putting them on bodies. We're seeing how, how they scale, how the colors look, how the textures look. And we're just, we're getting there. Totally not specific, totally not garments, but we're approaching that. And as I keep collaging, as I keep looking at visual references and creating new ones, I'll be back to visiting these references or in trying this technique out again. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'll do a bunch of these and I'll be completely satisfied and run with this. But as you know, that's probably not going to happen because, I mean, there have been like so very, very few times in my career where I've had the luxury of time like I do now. Like I have luxury of time because I am making my own schedule with my, <laughs> with my YouTube channel. But, you know, when I was working in industry and when I was working at school, it's like, here's the deadline. If you don't mean it, you're fired. And so you're running by the seat of your pants. And there are beautiful things that can come out of pressure and stress in that situation. And I'm all about it. I've had a blast and like, okay, I got to do the most amazing thing in six weeks. Got to do it. Got to do it. I'm crying the whole time. I have no time for sleep. And awesome things can happen. But yeah, given that I can do whatever the hell I want when I want, <laughs> when I want at this point, I'm gonna run with it. And so if that means collaging for a few more weeks, while I get to play around with possibilities. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. Yeah. Mm. No, I will not be starting a singing career anytime soon. Mm. So here's a super cool collage that was hung up on the wall at the Amuse Museum in Tokyo. I keep calling it the Boro Museum, but technically the name is Amuse Museum, A-M-U-S-E. Um, it's, it's such a cool museum, you guys. You have to go. If you're ever in Tokyo, go. And the best thing about the Amuse Museum, the Boro exhibit, is you can touch everything. Um... There's a photo somewhere on my Instagram, I think, of me trying on Boro kimono at the Muse Museum. Because the whole point of Boro is patching things as things get worn and threadbare. You patch and then you patch again and you wear it and keep using it and wearing it. And then you take another patch of fabric and you stitch it on. Like, that's the whole point. And so all the things there are meant to be touched and tried on and really like used 
I mean, I'm not going to actually sit there and walk around with the shoes on, but you know what I mean? And so all they'll do if something gets threadbare is patch it and just keep creating the borrow. It's so cool. So I had a blast there. So if you're ever in Japan, if you're ever in Tokyo, please go to the Muse Museum. They also have an excellent bookstore on the bottom floor. So of course, you know, I'm obsessed with Boro, but like, you know, as I'm collaging these things, I'm also thinking about, you know, what I could be doing to create these effects. Um, and I don't mean, not everything has to be an extreme literal translation. You know, some of them are going to be quite indirectly translated. But, you know, I do love the Boro, but the thing is, Boro is very handmade. And I have been chewing on this idea of how do you take Boro, this idea of Boro, and do something mass produced. And it doesn't have to, of course, you know, as I mentioned in the very beginning of this series, I'm not trying to look for a really cheap, fast way to do it. But still something that can be mass produced, something that you can produce without it having cost thousands of dollars. Okay? And I mean, I don't want to do a screen print because you lose the texture. And the texture and the stitching is such an important aspect of it that I'm thinking more in terms of hiring someone who specializes in applique work. And so instead of creating the entire fabric out of patches, to have a base fabric and to applique patches in an applique slash rough embroidery sort of process, and then, as I mentioned in the first video, I'm still very attracted to the idea of including patches of fabric and threads with the garments so that people who buy the garments can continue the patching process. I'm really into this idea. And, you know, I'm also interested in trying to make Boro look a little bit different. I don't want it to look like a straight up Japanese ripoff. I do want to take the inspiration and run with it and create something new with it. Uh, so there is that. It's a challenge when you find the original source material so incredible, but you know, it's gotta be done, you know? I wanna do the new stuff and that's me, that's my jam. So we'll figure it out. Here's one of my rust photos that I found. <laughs> I'm like, did I get this from Claire? Did I get this from me? Like, I think I got it from me. At this point, I can't remember because there's so many photos, but I'm pretty sure this is one of mine. I love these colors so hard. This lime, celery, and the browns and the oranges and just... And again, as I'm collaging and I'm laying down these blocks of color and kind of like creating kind of like vague visual feels for how this would look. Again, I'm thinking, okay, how would I get this look produced? And I mean, this one actually would be more believable and okay done as a screen print. I'm also thinking like a rough embroidery where if I had a screen print of the celery, lime, green colors, then I could do some kind of rough embroidery of the oranges and browns overlaid on top. Or I could create the whole fabric that way where, you know, the brown and orange rust embroidery runs along one selvage. And so, but then, Instead of having the orange along the top and then fading to green like I have it in these figure collages, then it would actually be running left to right because of the green. But yeah, at this stage, we're spitballing, we're thinking things out. And yes, later on, I did scribble these ideas down so that I would remember them. 
These are pictures of old doors in Tokyo. Uh, kind of the paint's been chipping. The wood is not in brand new condition or anything. Just playing around. And yeah, at this stage, these are not really the colors that I like. Not the colors I liked then, not the new colors I'm thinking of now, but it's really about playing with the textures and playing with the idea of maybe recreating similar textures in fabrics. Uh, I'm a big proponent of uh, fabric development and creating cool new fabrics um, and texture development and stuff. So we'll see. Again, we're just playing around. This is just a cool floor I saw somewhere in Tokyo. Uh, <laughs> I know people who travel with me fight, probably find me super annoying because I'm always stopping to take photos of the most inane things like floors. They're like, really, Zoe? I'm like, shut up. It's going to take a second. Anyway, so yeah, just play. If you're designing along with me, you know, just don't get too wrapped up at the stage on making things look like perfect garments because this is not what this is about. It's about playing with possibilities and this is still kind of an inspirational collage phase where you're just thinking about possibilities and loose ideas that will spark better ideas that will spark better ideas and you know keep propelling you forward the thing is is like you know i'm working really slow because i have the luxury of time and you know those of you designing along with me, you have the luxury of time. When you're working in the industry, you're not going to have the luxury of time. But the better you get at this process, the more you practice the process, the better you get at it, the faster you get at it, so that by the time you're working in the industry, you can you know, stay up to speed with your colleagues, and that's kind of the goal. Okay? And... Yeah, now I'm just going back in with the my super awesome glitter glue and just gluing stuff, making sure stuff's not falling out. <laughs> glitter forever. Yay. Anyway, so now I'm just gluing these pages into my sketchbook so that I can keep everything in one sketchbook, carry around this sketchbook. Anytime I have any kind of idea as to what I want to work on with this project, I can find the respective page and start scribbling on it. And, you know, just kind of, you know, me, always be practicing, always be designing. This is what I do. Always carry around these books and I'm always scribbling in one book or another and, yeah, being super antisocial. <laughs> Anyway, you know the drill. Give this video a big thumbs up if you found it interesting, informative, uh, entertaining. I've been getting a lot of comments lately that people love hearing my laugh, which is good since I tend to laugh at myself a lot. <laughs> Please subscribe, share, you know, drop me all your comments and questions. And I hope you really are designing along with me. Let me know if you are. And uh, I will see you in the next video.